Well, thanks for the introduction. Uh, while they're pulling up my slides, I'll just introduce myself uh, again. Paul Davies, I'm with Boeing's uh, Research and Technology Group. I'm based in Huntington Beach in Southern California, and uh, our group, uh, the Research and Technology Group, we, we develop uh, technologies for across commercial and defense sides of our business. And the one thing that my team has been focusing on for a number of years now is augmented reality. Um, mostly to communicate work instructions and, and, and 3D content to communicate that to people who build our airplanes. So our products are, of course, um, commercial airplanes, um, defense products, the F-15, um, uh, V-22, uh, uh, Chinook, Apache, and satellites. And so we've done augmented reality pilots um, on all three of those um, areas. Um, and the thing that I wanted to mention or, or kind of touch on before I start is that the complexity of our products is, is getting more complicated. Um, the 787 is the most complicated airplane we've ever built. It was designed using the most advanced design tools, 3D design tools. But for the most part, we still communicate those work instructions of how to build it um, using old school techniques, maybe 2D um, drawings, um, sometimes even on paper, maybe it's a PDF, but it's still you know, relatively... Um, I'll say, uh, um, not, not very advanced. It didn't keep up with the way we designed them. So that's what my team is looking at, better ways to communicate these work instructions um, to mechanics. And so as a researcher, all that is really great. You know, it's a really interesting field to be in, but um, obviously Boeing's you know, a business to make money, and so I have to be able to justify what we're doing and what we're spending money on. And so we've tried a number of techniques to um, understand and, and quantify uh, some of the benefits that we should see if we start using technology like augmented reality to communicate work instructions. It's, it's kind of a difficult thing to do, um, and I've got two examples of things we've been doing in that space, and so hopefully over the next 15 minutes, uh, well, you'll be able to get an understanding of what we've done. Uh, let's see, do I do the charts? I think so. Okay, so um, when we talk about the effects or the impacts of AR, there are five attributes that we've identified that we are interested in as a, as a manufacturing company. So. First of all, we're interested in reducing assembly errors. There's a number of root causes for an assembly error, um, but of course we want to uh, reduce them. Um, uh, an error on a billion dollar satellite could easily run into hundreds of thousands of dollars to fix. So you know, if we can eliminate just one or two errors in building a satellite, you know, we've already um, uh, you know, kind of proved our, our, our project's worth. And the second is we want to reduce training requirements. Uh, we want to be able to make our workforce more portable so that we train our workers in the kind of uh, basic skills of assembly rather than, in, rather than in the specifics of a particular um, job they might be doing. Uh, that way we can have workers move around, work on different programs with, with uh, more flexibility. Uh, we want to reduce assembly time. We want to be able to build airplanes faster. Um, we have a huge backlog of airplanes to build. Um, there's rate pressure on all of our commercial programs. We're trying to increase the rate. Um, 737 program in particular. So any technology that will enable us to build airplanes faster um, with the same or better quality is something we're interested in. And I believe AR is one of those, and I'll talk about that coming up. We want to help people understand and increase their recall of work instructions. Um, that's going to kind of linked in with the quality, but if we can have people understand their work instructions quicker, and they'll be more likely to retain them, uh, memorize them, uh, that's, a, that's of interest to us also. And of course, like another um, a number of other companies in this space, we, we're interested in transferring tribal knowledge. These are the kind of the nuances of assembly processes that may not be documented. Um, they're just through experience that uh, more senior um, mechanics would have. We want to be able to document that and capture it and then transfer it to some of our younger workforce. So augmented reality is a technology I believe can help there. So there's specifically, there's two things I want to mention, two, two studies we've done. One was an analytical study uh, that was in 2013, and we did this on one of our satellite programs. And what we did was we looked at um, the number of EPARs that were generated on each program. So an EPAR is really, uh, it's a documentation of a production anomaly. It's where a process wasn't followed, uh, or something happened that resulted in the satellite being built not conforming to the design. So we looked at the number of EPARs that were generated over four spacecrafts uh, on three different programs, three different satellite models we build. And then we got with the uh, integration lab folks, and when we tried to identify which of, the, which of those could, could have been affected if we had used augmented reality to communicate work instructions as opposed to uh, our existing technique, which was to have a computer in the, in the, in the work cell for, for workers to be able to go and look up instructions in 2D. So some of the areas we looked at were like flexible cable assembling, uh, assemblies, harness routing, component locations, stay-out zones, all those that we thought, if, you know, if we had an appropriate 
uh, augmented reality system that worked well, had a nice user interface, it was stable, um, could have helped with those, with those, um, with those areas. And we, we included some others too that we thought AR could help with. Uh, and then we looked at what, what effects those EPARs had on the critical path of the satellite uh, being built. And we tried to reduce that down to a number of days that we um, could have saved uh, on the satellite, which was really kind of an expansion of, this, of, the, um, of the schedule, unplanned delays uh, in the production schedule. So we came up with a number that I'm, I'm fortunately I'm not able to share here today, but it, I'm, I'll just say that it's not out of line with other studies of this, this nature. And it, it, it also kind of agrees with what I'm going to present um, coming up next. So the second um, technique we've done is using controlled studies. And this is, goes back to what Andy was just talking about with you working with universities. Uh, last year, we worked with Iowa State University to design and execute a controlled study where we compared different modes of assembling or providing assembly instructions for a part. So the part there is shown in the bottom left-hand corner. It, we called it a wing. It was just something representative of what we might build in Boeing. It, it had, um, I think it had about 30 parts to it. Um, there was about 50 steps to assemble it. Um, you, there's some, there was a parts bin that had all these fasteners and bolts and washers and, and things like that. And then we took people, students from the university, we ran them through this study and we asked them to build the wing uh, using one of three modes of instructions and then we paid them $20 for their time for doing it. So the, the, mode, the different modes that we provided were randomly assigned. So for every person that came into the study, uh, we assigned them either they would receive their instructions through a desktop computer it was a PDF file. It did have some 3D drawings on it, but they couldn't, you know, it wasn't true 3D. They couldn't rotate it. It was just a picture. Uh, they would have to go over to the corner of a room, access a workstation, step by step, learn what to do, go back to the wing, and then build it. Uh, and that, surprisingly, is actually remarkably similar to a lot of what we do in Boeing still and, and other companies. There's, there's usually a computer nearby that's available for, uh, for reference, and it would be sitting in the corner of a work cell or something like that. The second um, technique for delivering the work instructions was on a tablet PC, and it was the same, exact same instructions. It was the same PDF file, actually, same drawings, same sequences, uh, same length, and we put it on a tablet PC, and we said to the person, you can use this, you can take this tablet PC up to the point of use where you're working. Um, of course, the instructions are still going to be in 2D. And then for the third technique, we used our augmented reality system. And I should mention the system we're using, is, it was developed by my team, is really a prototype um, we're not really in the business of designing and, and producing and selling augmented reality technology, but we did build our own for, for our internal pilots and for this study here. Um, so we gave the third group of people um, the AR system. And we had each of them, uh, each person coming through, we had them build the wing twice. And they built it using the same mode of instruction. So if you were assigned the augmented reality system, you would build it once following your instructions, we would take it apart again, and then you would build it again using the same uh, mode of instruction so we could try and at least see the start of a learning curve and how that's affected by the different technologies. So this is a video of one of the participants being run through using the AR system. So you can see on the left there, uh, there's this short animation that's showing how that SPAR gets installed. And she's looking, we had cameras around the room. Uh, she's wearing that helmet so we can track her gaze, where, where her head's pointing, where she's looking. Uh, how much time she's spending uh, at the workpiece as opposed to maybe the parts bin or other areas. We're tracking her as she moves through the room. So you can see she's moved the tablet and it's now pointing toward the parts bin and it's saying for this step you need six of those parts and six of the ones down below. And she glances to make sure the right bin is being, being drawn from. When she's got the parts, uh, she just hits the next, uh, next task button and the, uh, this arrow pops up and shows her where in the room that task is located, and it was back to the wing. So she goes over there, and it, sh it animates and tells her what to do to install these bolts and these, these fasteners. So you get the idea. You ran through the, all of these steps were documented, and some of them had animations, not all of them, but they were all in 3D, and they were all accessible through the augmented reality tool. And of course, there's no other, there's no paper, there's no other um, communication allowed. The person monitoring. Uh, was not allowed to talk to the participant. There was no, uh, no, the only information she got was through this prototype AR tool. So when we look at the results, um, they were pretty impressive and actually more so than we were expecting. Uh, so as I mentioned, every person built the, the wing twice. The blue data is for the first time they built it and the green data is for the second time they built it. 
And when we look, this, this chart is representing the number of errors that, ha that they built. So as they, when the wing was complete, the person monitoring the test would grade um, the, the quality of the build and look at how many errors they made. Were they major errors or minor errors? Um, were they caught? Uh, or did, they, did the error end up in the finished product? And if they were caught, how long it took to fix? So using a desktop PC, uh, we saw median of eight number of, the number of errors, median number of eight. So that means um, out of about, I think it was um, 45 steps, there were eight, uh, eight mistakes the very first time somebody picked up a piece of paper and tried to follow and build the wing. The second time they did it, there were four mistakes. So obviously that's kind of the start of the learning curve, but still um, fairly high um, uh, rate of, of errors there. Now, interestingly, when we took the same information and we put it on the tablet PC, and again, just to remind you, this is the same document, the same 2D PDF document, uh, we saw a big drop off. Uh, now we're down to one error. Um, when they had the information next to them, just because it meant they didn't have to keep walking back and forward to the corner of the room. So that was interesting in itself, just putting technology at the point of use, not even necessarily AR technology, there's a big gain to be had there. But the key for us was when we, look, when we looked at the tablet, uh, the augmented reality on the tablet, again, we saw the reduced number of errors. We're down to one error now. And this, of course, this is a person, we've just, it's just a student who's no knowledge of what we're doing, no, no knowledge of the assembly, never seen it before picked up a tablet and was able to perform 45 steps and only make one error um, on this me you know, medium complexity assembly was pretty impressive. But the key on the second time they built it, nobody made any mistakes, um, which is where obviously we want to get to. And so it only took two tries and then nobody was making any errors. Um, so that's obviously very, very powerful for us. And when we expand this out, data like this out to the scale of what Boeing does, the number of airplanes we build, the number of operations, um, we, we could be, you know, we're talking, uh, you know, huge, a huge um, value for us. The next metric we looked at was the time it took to build uh, the wing. Uh, so again, the, the blue uh, is the first cycle, the green is the second cycle. So using the desktop computer, we're talking, you know, um, between, you know, the mean was 35-ish uh, minutes with 10% uh, range to 28 minutes up to 44 minutes, I guess 43 minutes. Um, and then we saw cause a big drop off. We went down to kind of 20 minutes. And then for tablet MBI, we were improved a little bit. This was the, the PDF on the tablet. And then for augmented reality, we saw uh, the fastest time. Uh, no, the, the impact wasn't as big as the reducing the number of errors, but still, we're able to um, speed up assembly time using, using augmented reality. Now, if we crunch these down to just uh, two numbers, uh, if we compare um, you know, the worst case, desktop computer for the first build to augmented reality to the best case, we saw first time quality improvement of over 90%. And it's numbers like this that I think Dexter, uh, wherever he was, is, he was alluding to earlier, usually you see these technologies and they, you know, they give you 5, 10, 15, 20% improvements. And when you see numbers like this, it really is an eye opener for, for people making the decisions. Um, so we were really happy to see that. And then the time to build the wing was reduced by around 30%. Um, so this really gave us the justification we needed to keep to keep looking at this technology and, and what we want to do with it. Now, I did just want to briefly mention, I'm, I know I'm out of time, just briefly mention that we also looked at, uh, it, it's not, it's not, it's not going to be 90% for any, any given task. You, any, not every task you know, lends itself to using augmented reality. So we looked at the different types of tasks that, that was involved in building the wing. Um, and some of them we saw, actually one of them we saw, I think it was... Um, uh, number five, uh, we actually saw higher, uh, it took longer um, to do uh, number five using augmented reality, step five. Um, and we wonder why that was. Um, step six uh, was much, much lower. Um, so there, there was some kind of, it wasn't equal 90% across the board. So we looked at why that was. Uh, step five happened to be that one that I showed in the example, the video earlier of the, that, that spar being twisted in. And that was actually causing some confusion for people because we weren't handling the occlusions. Um, don't know if I have a laser pointer, maybe I'll just point to it. Uh, so right here, where the model is being shown, it's actually shown above the part, and it really should be shown underneath the part. We weren't handling the occlusions uh, appropriately, and so that was causing some confusion. Uh, that was slowing people down. Um, step six is where you use a stack of washers as a spacer um, before you put a nut on the end of a bolt. And I think what was going on there was um, people would just assume there should be a dedicated spacer and you wouldn't just stack up washers. So when you read that instruction on paper, you may, you know, may cause some, some, some um, uncertainty in your mind of whether you're understanding the job. When instructions are presented with augmented reality, especially unusual instructions, uh, people believe it much, much quicker, and they, they take less convincing. So I, um, we're pretty confident that's why certain types of jobs that are maybe more, 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 excuse me, more unique um, 
lend themselves um, more towards AR. So I think that was my last chat. It was. I hope that was interesting. If anyone have any questions, I'll be around for the rest of the day, and I'll also be at the area mixer this evening, which is in the Hilton across the street. Thank you.